minds be stirred, nourish our sweet sacred story till we claim it as our own. Teach us through this holy banquet how to make love's victory known. Turn our worship into witness in the sacrament of life. Send us forth to love and serve you, bringing peace where there is strife. Give us Christ, your great compassion, to forgive as you words call us into worship today the heavens are telling the glory of God in all creation proclaims God's handiwork their voices go out through all the earth and their word to the ends of the world indeed we're gathered together some here and some online this morning on this world communion Sunday to worship God creator of heaven and earth and as we do so God welcomes us greets us with these words Grace and peace be yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ with you. And also with you. This morning as we enter into worship, we listen, we reflect on these words from the song Across the Lands. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand all creation holds together by the power of your voice let the skies declare your glory let the land and seas rejoice you're the gaze of angels came to seek and save the lost and exchange the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross with a prayer you fed the hungry with a word you stilled the sea yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free shout you rose victorious resting victory from the grave and ascended into heaven leading captives in your way now you stand before the father interceding for your own from each tribe and tongue and nation you are leading sinners home Lord of everyone. 
and nation, you are leading sinners home. These words speak to the universal truth of all humanity. We all sin. We all fall short. And so we come together in this place to confess that sin before God and before one another. During the prayer of confession today, you'll hear us say um, so many, most of the words actually, and when you hear the word, oh God, when you hear that phrase, oh God, you're invited to respond with, have mercy on us. So again, you hear, oh God, we invite you to say, have mercy on us. Let's pray together. God of all creation, you have called us to love neighbors near and far, but we prefer the comfort of our homes and the safety of our sameness. O oh God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. We keep our nearby neighbors at a comfortable distance with greetings and pleasantries while often failing at authentic relationships. O oh God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. We fan the flames of division, passing judgment on our neighbors who think and act differently than us. O oh God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. We keep our faraway neighbors, refugees, possible immigrants, those seeking help out while speaking of the safety of our borders and holding on to our suspicions of those who are not like us. Oh God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. On this World Communion Sunday, open our eyes to the ways we continue to let discomfort, division, and suspicion hinder us from relationship, reconciliation, and restoration and empower us by your spirit to truly live into your call to love our neighbors both near and far and we pray this in the name of jesus and together we say amen, amen. it's a conversation between jesus and nicodemus nicodemus comes to jesus in the evening because he doesn't want to be found out he doesn't want to be seen and he asks jesus all sorts of questions and in the midst of the conversation, Jesus offers those wonderful gospel-esque words. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but may have everlasting life. For indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world that the world might be saved through him. Friends, this is the good news. Go forth to live in its peace. Amen. This morning we are uh, delighted and privileged to welcome the Reverend Dr. Cambria Coltwasser to share God's word with us this morning. Cambria, of course, is a friend of ARC. Uh, she and Jared are members here, and she also serves as assistant professor of biblical and theological studies at Northwestern College. She has both her Master of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary, and she is ordained in the PCUSA. We are delighted to have Cambria with us and so grateful for Cambria's willingness to kind of step in as I continue to recover uh, from my recent heart attack. Um, so welcome, Cambria. We're delighted to have you. Thank you so much. Will you pray with me? O oh God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture for this morning comes from the first chapter of Ruth. Verses, six, verses 1 through 10 and 14 through 22. Hear the word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. 
The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem, When they came to Bethlehem, the the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter in law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This story begins with an ending. Naomi, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, sets out for Bethlehem. But this is no fresh start. After all, Naomi has already lived a lifetime. From birth to old age, she has lived the journey from home to foreign country and back again. She has lived both the love and the death of her husband the lifetimes of her two sons from birth to death, lived finally to see all that is dearest to her die. In this opening chapter, Naomi arrives back where she began. She started to return. Our story begins. In this opening chapter, 13 different times, we get a variation of the Hebrew root shub, meaning to turn back or to turn, to return. They set out to return to Bethlehem. Naomi commands her daughters-in-law to return to Moab, commands Ruth, return after your sister-in-law, but Ruth will not turn back. The two women return to Judah, and the Lord has returned Naomi empty. At the dizzying repetition of the word, We lose our footing and forget just which direction Naomi is facing. 
And what does it matter, the direction, when for Naomi, there seems to be no progress, only regress? What has this lifetime brought Naomi but the undoing of all that she had meant for good? Whatever progress she has made, whatever plans, whatever hopes, all has come down to nothing. I went away full, she says, and the Lord has brought me back empty. I sense that it won't be hard for us to get into the mood of this chapter this morning. In COVID season, we're all wrestling in one way or another with suffering and with waste of suffering. It's now been seven months of battling the, this pandemic as a nation, of making sacrifices, of suffering losses on personal and national scales. And what do we have to show for ourselves? We might question whether the losses have forged any sense of cooperation toward the common good, whether we are really in this fight together, and we might wonder, like Naomi, whether we are accursed. A deep wound has struck Naomi at the core. She continues on, but not as one of the living. In her despair, she tries to banish Ruth and Orpah, the only extensions of kindness in her vicinity, a kindness she holds forth as an example for God, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. It is telling that the blessing Naomi invokes for her two daughters-in-law, she does not trust to be good for herself. Which begs the question, will God be God for Naomi? It is clear from her testimony that Naomi does not think that the Lord has dealt kindly with her at all. And the narrator does not discredit Naomi's testimony or cast any blame on her. Her words are not treated as unreliable. She is not rebuked for her lament. From the text, we learn only that she has been stricken and that she feels God's hand has gone out specifically against her. It is more bitter for me than for you, she tells her daughters-in-law. Naomi's journey witnesses to the isolating nature of suffering, its tendency to make us feel accursed. Henri Nouwen writes about this curse of suffering in his book, Life of the Beloved. Not only do we experience loss and do we suffer, but we often believe that our suffering is communicating a deep truth to us about who we are, that we are alone, that we are unloved, and that finally God, too, has abandoned us. It is as though a hidden sadness threatening us our lives long were finally confirmed in all its ugly truth. And so, for Naomi, suffering has become the key by which she interprets her life story. She tells the villagers in Bethlehem, Call me no longer Naomi, whose meaning is sweetie. Call me Mara, that is, bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Will God be God for Naomi? Will God be God for us who, like Naomi, have known our suffering so personal to each one of us to be a doom inflicted specially on us? It's part of the agony of this COVID season that we seem doomed to face our challenges alone without the typical comforts of physical touch and close gatherings with loved ones. This physical isolation may also lead us to retreat into a spiritual isolation. And like Naomi, 
in our despair, we may send away messengers of comfort. In the 2016 indie film, The Fundamentals of Caring, um, the film portrays two men, each separately afflicted by this curse of suffering. Ben is a retired writer, estranged from his wife since the tragic death of their newborn son. Unable to face up to their impending divorce and still trying to ignore his grief at the loss of his son, Ben embarks upon a new venture by becoming the home caregiver of an 18-year-old boy with muscular dystrophy named Trevor. Meanwhile, Trevor is doing his own hiding. Enabled by a mother who keeps him sheltered at home, controlling his life through rigid routines. Trevor suffers not only from his lack of the typical experiences of youth, but also from the fact that his father abandoned him in his infancy. He copes by alienating each new caregiver hired by his mother through caustic, unkind humor and derision. These two men, Ben and Trevor, each live behind a mask constructed to obscure the curse of their affliction that effectively seals them off from others. Ben in his false air of professionalism and Trevor in his attitude of derision each holds others at arm's length. But finally, it is Ben who calls Trevor's bluff by proposing they embark on a road trip to see some of the roadside destinations that fascinate Trevor. As travel often does, this journey becomes the occasion for each man to let his guard down. Each comes clean about the sources of his anguish, and each provides the other companionship they have not known for a long while. As is so often the case, healing doesn't come through the wave of a wand, and there are certain wounds that can't be erased. But both Ben and Trevor find their courage to live another day, revived simply through the simple act of friendship, the presence of another human being who refuses to be sent away. Ruth does not allow herself to be sent away. Instead of heeding her mother-in-law, Ruth plants herself firmly at Naomi's side, where you go, I will go, says Ruth. Where you die, I will die. Ruth, the Moabite, the one we can least expect to know anything about Israel's God or covenant, Ruth makes a covenantal pledge to Naomi. And we know that through the course of the book, Ruth turns out to be the agent of God's faithfulness to Naomi securing a husband from among Naomi's kinsmen to redeem both women. Yet for a time, there is little indication that Naomi recognizes Ruth beside her, an obtrusive fellow traveler at her side. Ruth prefigures another fellow traveler. Two men set out on a journey to Emmaus, blinded with grief, by the events that have, they have witnessed in Jerusalem so that they are kept from recognizing the stranger in their midst. To themselves they lament, we had hoped this Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel. Had hoped, but now it has been three days since his death. All has come to nothing. And it is not until the breaking of the bread that their eyes are cleared to see the stranger in their company as their salvation enfleshed, the risen Jesus. Like Ruth to Naomi, he has promised to be with us to the end. Unwilling to be apart from us, our God came down into our broken and death-dealing world, being born to a young pair of refugees without even a proper shelter to rest in. 
born as a child who even at his birth was already being hunted by the greedy powers that run this world. He knew what it was like to be rejected by his hometown friends. He shared in our heartbreak for lost loved ones as he stood at Lazarus' grave. He felt the betrayal of his closest friends and knew what it meant to be crushed by a culture of death. Meanwhile, binding himself so closely, so closely to our bitterness and sorrow that he made our cry to God his own. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his dying and by his rising, God reveals God's self to be unambiguously and irrevocably for us. However distorted her vision, however blinded by her tears, Naomi recognizes God while in the heart of her suffering. It is the promise of the Lord's visit to Judah that lures her along the road home as her last thread of hope. It is the blessing of the Lord that she invokes for her daughters-in-law, and it is the Lord's hand against which she wrestles. Finally, it is the Lord to whom she attributes returning her home empty-handed. Yet we know that if it is the Lord who has brought her back empty, it is the Lord who will fill her again, who has brought her to Bethlehem, whose name means the house of bread at the beginning of barley harvest. In this text, we hear echoes of the promise of Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. My friends, we are the sufferers who, though broken, are also blessed. For Christ has traveled this road before us, and he is with us now. In the power of Jesus Christ, we trust that what God did for Naomi, God will do also for us. My friends, I invite you this morning to come to the table of the Lord, that though you have sown in tears, you may reap with songs of joy. And though you are empty, that you may be filled. Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you that you are not content to be God only on high and in great majesty, but that you wanted to be God with us and for us, taking up our suffering from the inside. Allow us this morning to look again to your promise, the one in which you are making all things, even the most dingy, new. Surprise us again and again by your abundant grace to us. In Christ Jesus, our brother, we pray. Amen. Truly, it began last night. We were going to get bed, but Christians uh, on the other side of the world gathered around the signs and symbols of God's grace, God with us in Jesus, these signs and symbols of communion. As our globe shifted, Christians in China and the Middle East, Europe, Africa broke and chewed, poured and sipped the symbols of Christ's body and blood. Beyond country and culture, those celebrating today span many creeds and confessions, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Baptists, thousands of other believers and denominations, and even those with no denominational label. 
this morning is significant, not only because we get to join others around the world in this feast recognizing God's grace, but as the American Reformed Church community, we are celebrating communion for the first time after a long fast. Today, we remember that Christ does what we find it so hard to do, breaks down barriers, destroys all dividing walls. Communion unites us as one family. If you are present here this morning in person, or if you're watching online, or if you celebrate later today or even next week while you watch on local cable access television stations, we know that you are welcome this morning. You are welcome to receive these signs of God's grace. This morning we acknowledge we're celebrating World Communion Sunday a bit differently with this wafer and this pre-poured cup. This is not how we normally do things. So if you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you, when you're invited to do so, you'll see on the screen that invitation to take off your mask and to partake first in the wafer and then next in the cup. Um, we invite you to not remove your mask until you see that invitation, and then the screen will also let you know when you may put it back on. We know these elements, the wafer and the pre-poured cup, aren't what we are used to. We recognize that throughout the history of the church, communion has taken on different forms according to culture, custom, and circumstance. And this is our circumstance today. The screen will invite you to open each one separately when it is time. Both the wafer packet and the juice cup may be difficult to open. And so Brenda Richardson is in the back on the lookout for anyone who might need assistance with those things this morning. Please raise your hand if you have problems so that she can come and help you if it's needed. If you didn't receive a wafer or a cup on your entrance, please also let Brenda know that so she can hand those out to you. And as always, children are welcome to receive communion at the discretion of their parents and guardians, whether here or online. This morning, our communion prayer preparing us to receive these gifts of God comes from a poem, And the Table Will Be Wide, translated by ARC friends Jenny Song into Mandarin, Ali Amel into Arabic, and Laura Yonker into Spanish. Let's hear these words as our prayer this morning. Y la mesa será amplia. Una bendición para el domingo de comunión mundial. Wattawila satakuna wasiatun. Wattarhibi wasiatun. Wallayadi wasiatun liturahibuna. Woman the sin hui chang kai jie shou. Woman hui xiang hai zi yang xiang xin hui yu zu go. 我们将不受阻碍自由地来到 Y nuestro dolor será recibido con pan Y nuestro dolor será recibido con vino Y abriremos nuestras manos a la fiesta sin vergüenza Wasalakuna ma'abadun al-badun bila khawfu وسنترك أحزاننا وندوق ونعرف طعم البهجة. ومن جان تنوي جيء شجيد من بعض، ومن هوي بين تن كوكا رمنا غانلي. والمبارك سيكون البركة، وفي كل مكان ستكون الوليمة. Y los bienaventurados se convertirán en bendiciones, y en todas partes será el banquete. Say that with me, and the blessed will become the blessing and everywhere will be the feast. And together, all God's people say, Amen. In this feast, we remember that Jesus 
body was broken and blood shed for the reconciliation and healing of every tongue and tribe of all. Around the world, bread of many different types, colors, textures, broken, crumbled, and passed. Some sourced from wheat, others rice or corn, large chunks or pressed wafers. But beyond taste and type and appearance, these words, the language unfamiliar to us, tell a familiar story. وفي الليلة التي تعرض فيها اليسوع للخيانة اليسوع أخذ الخبز وقطعه وعطى الشكر ومن ثم عطى تلاميذه قطعة من الخبز وقال خذ وأكل هذا جزء من جسم الذي أعطيه لكم The body of Christ broken for us unites us And we eat and drink with the hope that one day the oppressed will be set free, the hurting healed, and all wrongs made right. Around the world, the cup, shining gold, tiny thimble-sized, rough pottery, maybe worn hands just holding sour wine, sweet juice, perhaps just dirty water from a nearby well, and beyond taste, and type and appearance, these words, the language unfamiliar to us, tells a familiar story. وبعد ما أكلوا أخذ اليسوع الكوب وقال هذا العهد الجديد المنسوخ بدمي كلما تشربوا تذكروني. The blood of Christ shed for us unites us. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God, you, all of us, together. Amen. Just one prayer update before we come to God in the prayers of the people this morning. We extend our blessing and thanksgiving um, and celebration, prayers of celebration to Ben Patsloff and Sidney Kolb, who were united in marriage yesterday here at American Reform Church in a small ceremony with their closest uh, family members and friends. And so we celebrate with Ben and Sidney now living in Des Moines. And Ben is working at uh, Central Presbyterian Church as director of youth ministries uh, part-time and is also enrolled uh, in the distance learning program at Western Theological Seminary. And so we, right now at American Reformed Church, have three students enrolled at Western, Laura Yonker, Daniel Tolzma, and Ben. And so we extend our prayers of blessing uh, for all of those students as well. Let's join our hearts together in the prayers of the people. God of love, God who is with us, you have called us to be members of one body, Join us with those who in all times and places have praised your name that with one heart and mind we may show the unity of your church and proclaim your message of love and sacrifice. We bring before you the disunity of today's world, the absurd violence and war, the extreme division and polarization, all of which are breaking the courage of the peoples of the world. Remind us, your church, to be an example of unity healing, and love. We bring before you that which threatens life on the planet, human greed and injustice, pollution and consumption. Remind us, your church, that we are the stewards and caretakers of your creation. We bring before you the places and people struggling with illness, hunger, addiction, grief, brokenness. Remind us, your church, that we are called to grieve with those who grieve, to rejoice with those who rejoice, and to come alongside those in need to share the burden. And send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. Teach us to be compassionate toward the whole human family. Strengthen us in the pursuit for justice and for peace. 
And may the prayer taught to us by Jesus, our companion, be our guide as we pr pray together. Our, our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we respond by reflecting on the words of the song, I Come With Joy. Let's listen together. typically practice during this season, we will be dismissing you row by row. Elizabeth and I will move to the back following the benediction this morning. We'll dismiss you row by row. You're invited to make your way outside and uh, in chat outside with your uh, sisters and brothers in Christ, spend some, some time uh, fellowshipping with each other. We also know that we continue to rely on your uh, tithes and offerings, even though we no longer receive the tithes and offerings uh, in worship, there's a box in the back. You may drop your tithes and offerings in that box. You may also mail. You may also give online. We are so grateful for uh, your ongoing support, which is vital for the mission and ministry of this congregation. Uh, we continue to, of course, uh, employ staff who continue to serve in ministry, and we continue to want to support our RCA global missionaries uh, serving in all parts of the world. And so your financial support is essential as we continue to seek to be about our mission as a congregation, a place that seeks to be transformed by Jesus so that we might indeed bring that transformation to the world. Thank you for all your gifts. As you go out into the world today, may these words ring in your ears. The love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen.